loved. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we are here to talk about what I think is one of the most exciting, um, one of the most exciting ideas that is going to change our world over the next 10, 20 years. As you just heard, it is the tantalizing prospect that the psychedelic drugs um, are going to be able to treat a whole range of disorders. And we have with us the man who is leading the, uh, leading the charge on this whole world and this whole new idea, Florian Band, CEO of Atai Life Sciences. Really exciting. Thank you. Um, so could we start, because I know this is obvious to you, but a lot of people here won't know the full story. Could you just give them like two minutes on uh, where this kind of psychedelic research started, how it stopped, and kind of like why we're seeing this renaissance now? Sure. Um, so psychedelics actually go back um, millennials in terms of how they were used, used by humanity. So there's interesting research going on, how they've been used uh, very, very many hundreds of years, of, years ago um, in ritualistic religious settings. So Brian Moresco, for instance, has written a very interesting book about this, it's research out of Harvard um, on, the, on the role in that uh, element of society. And um, in the 50s and 60s, they were actually very heavily researched in, um, in also the Western world for neuropsychiatric diseases and showed great promise already back then. But then in the 70s, there was an immense backlash um, with the war on drugs uh, that was announced by or implemented by the Nixon administration in the US that led to the scheduling of uh, various substances, including psychedelics, meaning that they were classified as, uh, basically that they were classified as not having an, any uh, medical use, which made the research very, very hard then in the 70s and beyond. And only in 2016, with the mental health crisis becoming more and more evident. So now we have a billion people globally suffering from mental health disorders and really no innovation over the last 20 years. And um, in 2016-17, the openness from regulators again increased and also the research in the academic world increased. And there was this one or basically two landmark studies, one, of, one out of John Hopkins in Baltimore and one out, uh, out of uh, the Imperial College in London that really showed large effect sizes in patients suffering from depression and anxiety uh, when treated with psilocybin in a therapeutic, psychotherapeutic assisted environment. Um, and yes, yeah, since then, that was also the roundabout the time when we got involved, 2018, when we started the company to really um, help rigorously research those compounds next to the other drug development programs and digital therapeutics that we are, that we are uh, researching. So what is a tie actually actually doing, and like how is that different from other people in the market? Like what's your like path? Like where do you sit in this psychedelic renaissance? Right. So we are um, so we are a biopharmaceutical company. So we're doing clinical trials in depression, anxiety, uh, and addiction primarily. Also focus on other mental health uh, indications, where these three are the core areas of our interest and where we're developing drugs. Um, and we're really interested in anything that could truly mean a leap forward for patients. It's, in our view, it, it's basically their personal reasons why it started with psychedelics, but we're equally excited about other pharmacological options uh, as well as digital therapeutics, as I uh, alluded to earlier. Um, and what we basically do is once we identify an interesting compound, everything started with psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Um, and we basically uh, usually form companies around the compound and the IP and um, provide funding, but also operational expertise. So we have around about 100 people on the Atai platform, and they hands-on work with the scientific founders um, that are focused on their own molecules. We have 11 drug development programs uh, on, on the platform, and we collaborate with those and jointly develop them through the clinical phases. Uh, where you have those three, uh, and also do, are doing some preclinical work to bring those um, therapies to patients. Um, obviously, a lot of in, in these studies, there's a lot of numbers and you know trials that are large numbers of people that kind of show that this stuff is working. But can you maybe talk about um, some things you've seen firsthand, some people you've seen firsthand that have like 
really been helped by this? And like, how has it helped them? Like, why has it helped them? Can you kind of bring it alive for us? Yeah. Um, so that is actually the very reason why we started at Thai. So I uh, was working together with my co-founder, Lars, who was also a co-founder at a previous company, um, in a completely different sector, and then through his suffering, so he developed a depression uh, and had psychotherapy and tried, uh, he also had anxiety, so he tried benzodiazepines, he tried SSRIs, uh, and nothing really helped for him. He only experienced the severe side effects, which can be like weight gain, cognitive impairment, um, so, and these are kind of the milder side effects that you can experience, and it's really trial and error experience for the patient, so you sometimes need to wait uh, up to 12 weeks whether an SSRI works, an antidepressant works. So we really observed the, this, this terrible mental health patient journey if you have a patient that doesn't respond to existing treatment options. We are, uh, and we have basically 33% uh, of people not responding to current options that are classified as treatment resistant, like last wars. Um, and then he, after he came across the studies that we talked about earlier on out of John Hopkins and Imperial, that had so encouraging results. He, in a jurisdiction where, where it's legal, basically had a, had a high dose psilocybin experience in a therapeutic setting, and that really changed his life extremely to the better. So he was extremely depressed, went into the psychedelic experience, the uh, psychedelic session together with a therapist, and came out um, truly re-energized and was able to access the trauma that he believed to be the root cause and work through it. Um, and that was kind of then a life-changing moment for him. So he had long-term depression. He tried lots of different things. He then had a single dose, right. high dose of psilocybin with a therapist. And then now he's more or less okay. Is that, is yeah. that what happened? I mean, for him, it was really this one single high dose that, uh, as he puts it, was a very curative experience for him. We. Um, uh, believe that unfortunately that won't hold true for every single person. So we believe there's not this one-size-fits-all solution. So unfortunately, psilocybin is not a panacea. Uh, in, in depression, you have a very heterogeneous patient population. So it's really depressions versus depression, or anxieties versus anxiety. It's very individual treatment patterns of, of a patient. Um, and so we believe we really need to develop a, di a diverse array of pharmacological or, or also digital therapeutics um, to address that very unique um, uh, mental health issue in, in a very yeah, tailored way for the patient. Um, I really want to get on to talking about the digital uh, stuff, because that's really interesting. But can we just talk about like, why, why they think it works, or why you think it works, why, what the kind of working theory? Is it that this, is it like accelerated therapy, which is fundamentally good and helps you work through like core issues or is it actually chemicals in your brain that you know get tweaked for the better uh, or is that a too philosophical a question yeah so I, I don't have a science background so full disclosure but in a simplified way uh, psychedelic or it, let's take psilocybin as an example there's currently the hypothesis that two major factors are driving the efficacy. One is that it downregulates the default mode network, so you have different brain networks in your, uh, in your brain, and the default mode network is basically responsible for the sense of self, and is also the reason why often uh, you overly remun uh, you have rumination, rumination is I think the English word, um, where you're overthinking stuff. You're thinking like, oh, why did I do this? What did I do wrong? So it's always very ego-focused, ego very much eye-centric. So it's basically the sense of self. And when you down-regulate this one, you kind of also lower in a simplified uh, way expressed the, the kind of the guards in, in a way. So that, uh, that and allows you to, to access certain traumatic experience in, a, in an easier way that you might not be able to access if you're uh, just having psychotherapy without the substance. And on the other hand, it um, increases the level of neuroplasticity. So how, you're, how basically um, it helps new connections of neurons being formed. Um, and also uh, it helps neurogenesis, so new neurons can be created. And that is very helpful in the um, phase after the experience. So you have a two week window of neuroplasticity where you can really successfully um, implement new habits, which can be very helpful, you can implement meditation practices, mindful practices that can help you in the, in the long term. So these are two, two elements that are assumed to drive the efficacy as we 
know it today. Um, can you tell us where we are on this clinical journey? Because obviously, I mean, we've been talking about psilocybin, but there's MDMA, there's ketamine, right. there's DMT, there's ibogaine, there's all sorts. Um, what, like, when are we likely to be to get, you know, X, Y, and Z? Like, what is, what is, like, what's the time scale here? So we are, uh, I mean, in us usually in, in the clinical studies, you have phase, the three phases. Phase one is to um, research the safety of the compound. Phase two um, is uh, basically designed to show proof of concept, so basically that it works, so you have efficacy. Um, and phase three wants to basically reprove that in a, in a larger uh, patient population. And with that data, then you go to regulators with a data set and uh, seek approval of that compound or, or treatment. And then you seek also with that data the, the reimbursement, which is very important for us, as uh, often the vulnerable, not so affluent groups in the population are the most exposed to, to mental health issues. And with Compass, they are our very first company that is researching psilocybin, so the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Uh, they just published their phase two uh, data, um, which was very promising. We saw a large effect size here in severely depressed treatment-resistant depression. That was uh, 233 patients uh, that were um, re uh, taking part in the trial globally. And um, the next step would then be a phase three. So it's still a couple of years until we would have, uh, assuming that everything is reproduced also in the phase three, um, uh, that we would basically get access in the medical system. So like five years or what's normal? Yeah, uh, up to, yeah, roundabout. It's, it's, I think it's a, it's a reasonable assumption. MDMA th therapy could be a little bit quicker uh, accessible. So MAPS, which is actually, uh, a very interesting organization because it's a non-profit organization that has been researching MDMA-assisted therapy for over 30 years. So Rick Doblin is here, the, the thought leader in that space. And um, they published phase three data in May this year, I believe. And also very, very remarkable data showing that MDMA-assisted therapy uh, in PTSD, so post-traumatic um, stress disorder patients, uh, was very, very effective. 60% of the patients treated with MDMA in a also assisted uh, therapeutic set setting uh, didn't, weren't cl uh, classifying as um, PTSD patients anymore, which is very remarkable. So that shows the potential, but also here you have to do, we have to do another uh, phase three trial, uh, or they have to run another phase three trial, and then it takes a little time to communicate with the regulators and to get it eventually approved. So also here a couple of years away still. Um, so there's MDMA, which is maybe the closest. So it's MDMA for PTSD. Right. There's psilocybin, which is maybe a few more years after that for treatment-resistant depression. Yeah. Um, what are the other ones that are maybe slightly more moonshotty, uh, and like when when might we be getting those if they work? Um, mo moonshotty um, in a way of. More, more radical, you mean, or yeah, or like the ways? ones that are maybe that have done. I mean, those those are both the the most sort of tried and tested. Uh, but like ibogaine, DMT, right. etc., are there like ones that are further out that we? They're they're a little further out. So we have one other compound um, which is rooted in ketamine, um, S ketamine, that was actually approved 2019. So that kind of also demonstrated that regulators are very much open for. Uh, I guess pharmace uh, yeah, pharma pharmaceutical drugs rooted in stigmatized compounds. So this is a dissociative, this is not a classical psychedelic, but it also falls broadly in, in this category. So that was uh, approved as ketamine, it's commercialized under the name Spovato. Um, also has to be taken in an inpatient environment. In terms of the, the next um, uh, drug development programs in our uh, pipeline, DMT you mentioned, Ibogaine, here we are uh, about to go in the phase one with, with DMT and uh, are currently in a phase one actually in the UK with, with Ibogaine. So also here um, still, still a couple of years out and, uh, unfortunately, um, but we're working very hard to move this in the, as fast as possible yet responsible way forward. Um, I was doing my research ahead of this and I saw an interview done with Fox News and they'd said something along the lines of, 
So you're going to give uh, LSD to children, you know, you're going to make it all these drugs legal and you're going to ruin our kids. And like, that was the kind of like, you know, are you mad basically was the sort of tone. Yeah. Um, do you like, what's it, what's it been like going to regulators? I mean, in the early days, going to investors, Atai uh, listed a few, uh, um, a, few, a few months ago, but in the early days, going to investors and talking about something uh, that's pretty out there. Right. Yeah, I mean, simple things like opening a bank account was very tricky in, in the beginnings, especially in the US, because they are, I guess, afraid that it's somehow like cannabis and it's not federal legal in the US. So they were, they were hypersensitive to this topic, so they had to run through as, uh, reputation committees, etc. So there's a lot of stigma around those substances still pointing also, I mean, that's also why I guess the Fox News rather conservative guy was so uh, aggressive in, in, in that sense to point out that uh, this is quite controversial what we're doing. Um, but if you basically... Um, Look at it. Is, so we're we are, so we are in R and D. We are producing the data that is needed to demonstrate the regulators ultimately, which is one of the stakeholders that we need to convince. So we are taking very consciously a very uh, conservative, science-driven approach to convince all the stakeholders in this field. But initially, we, we had a lot of headwinds. So also from the traditional biotech investors, there was a lot of skepticism. So for us, it was very fortunate to have that we had a founder team. Um, and Christian Angermeyer being one of, one of those founders, that he has a significant wealth through kind of his first biotech and then he did a lot of investments after. Um, so he kind of, I think it was key that we had his backing to get through the first uh, year to actually demonstrate that this is viable and we are not ludicrous. And a lot of people said like, guys, this is a little too out there. Um, so this, th there was a unique combination in the, founding, in the founder team that I believe led to the early success uh, and allowed us as outsiders to the biotech world coming from tech, um, which was maybe necessary to be as bold to move into this, um, to help us to the early, early phase. So it was Christian, who was the other founder, he'd exited before, had money, and he had supported the business in the early years. And you think without that, you may not have got the original money yeah. to even be able to prove that something was going on. Right. I mean, traditionally in biotech, you have a, it's a very closed ecosystem where you have like a handful of very strong uh, BCs uh, that kind of set the tone. Um, and then a number of key opinion leaders that set the tone, what's a viable investment, what's a viable mechanism of action and what's not. And if they are not on board, there's a lot of reluctance in this field. So in our case, we had Christian with his own money and his network and rather Silicon Valley people like tech investors, uh, maybe not surprisingly, um, coming on board, um, including Peter Thiel, um, that then kind of helped us to uh, yeah, make the first mile and with that data that we then generated and basically with a pr proof of also of our operating model showing that we are successfully spinning out in, in a company to, to the Nasdaq, that we are successfully able to partner with a large pharmaceutical company. So basically that helped us to get there and that was then the moment also when academic research increased and more and more data was coming out that led to also the biotech community to buy in. And they are, in the meantime, fully on board. Uh, also launched uh, other companies in this field. Um, that was, yeah, that was key. And when you talk to regulators, are they like super conservative and skeptical? Or are they just like, we'll look at any data. And if the data's there, great. If not, not. But we're not, you know, we're, we're yeah. under the skin of the game. Yeah, no, it's definitely the latter, and they have been very open. They um, gave breakthrough therapy designations so with the FDA, gave, which is the regulatory authority that approves drugs in the US, uh, gave breakthrough therapy designation to Compass in 2018, um, uh, and, uh, and they're developing psilocybin, and 2017 for the MDMA-assisted therapy. So um, there is definitely... Uh, an approach that is very rigorous, data-driven, um, and they're very open to look at that data. They're, um, yeah, and that they're not, I guess, scared away by the, the stigma. So they're, they were surprisingly um, and, and thankfully, gratefully, very, very open to the approach they were taking. Um, 
a few of the companies like yourselves who have gone down the for-profit route um, have been quite controversial in the kind of psychedelic community. There's a sort of world that I guess is like maybe quite anti-capitalist, I don't know, but like, uh, and there are other companies, you mentioned Maps, which has been working on MDMA for a long time, which is not for profit. Um, so you guys coming along was, yeah, was, was, was controversial. Um, how did you handle that? Um, like, why did you, I mean, first, like, why did you choose the for-profit route to begin with? Uh, and also kind of how did you handle that, that backlash in the community? So, um, I mean, we, we contemplated many approaches, also including non-profit approaches in the very beginning, but quickly realized that the fastest way to actually get those mental health innovations, including the psychedelics, to patients is the for-profit model. And the reason is that, uh, the reason lies in the fact that um, drug development is extremely expensive. So you need hundreds of million to run one trial. Um, and this is very hard to raise from a, uh, from a non-profit uh, because it, there needs to be attached a certain RI to raise those, those, those amount, amounts of uh, funds. Uh, MAPS has been successful, but it took them a very long time, 30 years, to get now to a phase, th uh, phase three results and hopefully to approval in, over the next years. Um, we believe that the for-profit approach, which, um, by the way, every other biotech company and every other indication in oncology is taking, so we're... Uh, we are in a unique position because there is this psychedelic community which is rather left anti-capitalist and there's this notion that this is a holy molecule because it allows you to access the universe, the God, because a lot of people have very spiritual experiences on psychedelics, that this is, um, it's evil to try to make money with this. On the other hand, you need patents in order to recoup the investment. Um, so we decided to go that way because we believe ultimately that's the most rigorous way. It allows us to produce that data that is, again, as we discussed earlier, required to convince all the stakeholders that this is a viable treatment and ultimately, again, also convince insurance companies to reimburse those treatments. Um, and yeah, that's the reason why we picked the for-profit model. Um, and how did you deal with the backlash? I mean, was it just trying to continually, like, constantly communicate and explain? Like, what was your strategy for, for, that, for that stakeholder group? Yeah, I mean, we, we are trying to be very open and inclusive and engage in, in um, controversial discussions, so we're not shying away from that. And uh, we launched recently also our own um, foundation, our own Atai Impact Initiative, that is um, also a non-profit, so we're uh, having a non-profit arm that is very much focused on destigmatizing mental health. And we are, I guess, we are in a very stigmatized mental health indication area. Um, so it's not, not easy for someone to talk about their mental health issues. And at the same time, we're tackling this problem with a highly stigmatized compound group. So I think there is a lot of... Uh, work to be done on the very upper awareness level, um, and that's what we're doing with the nonprofit. In addition to um, educating um, or, or help education and help research, basic research so on the education part, and also engage with um, the ecosystem at large. That also includes indigenous people who, for centuries, kept this science or this medication alive. Um, and here, we're very interested to learn and how we can best integrate their experiences, their, te their techniques, into the Western medical system. Um, do you have a lot of founders, tech people here? Um, what's kind of next for this sector? Like, what's the next big innovation? Like, what are you most excited about? Like, Maybe we don't need like more massive companies trying to do phase three uh, clinical trials on psilocybin. There are people doing that, but like, what do people need to be doing? Like, what's the if we think this is going to be like a huge trend over the next twenty years and is going to transform the mental health of a hundred million people yeah. uh, or more? Um, you know, what should people in this room be thinking about, be working on? Um, so we are R&D focused, so we are a research company, we are, um, I guess, keeping, up, keeping the optionality to also get involved in commercialization, but currently we don't assume that we will run clinics. So you, a lot of those therapies will need an infrastructure um, because they are inpatient treatments, so you need a, 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 basically a therapist 
that guides you through the psychedelic experience, and that requires clinics and um, offices and a, a, uh, a new paradigm in psychiatry that needs to be established uh, in, in Europe, uh, in the USA, and beyond. Um, and I think these kind of auxiliary uh, uh, additional services next to the, the research that we're doing are, are key to scale, to reach a scale, uh, to reach the one billion, uh, one billion people globally that are currently suffering. So there's a lot to be done around just researching those molecules um, to, yeah, to get them out uh, as soon as uh, they are approved. Fantastic. Um, well, that's the end of our that's the end of our time. It feels uh, incredibly incredibly short. Um, but I think I mean for me, I was just stunned by like the scale, like I guess the scale of the market. I mean, I've seen actually in previous uh, stuff you guys have done talking about like a total addressable market of more or less everyone because everyone needs you know needs better mental health. Um, like a billion people. Uh, this is like an incredible mission-driven company, and I was really amazed as well by just the personal story that this comes from, you know, yourself and your friend. Uh, that really brings it to life. Uh, and I hope you all felt the same and enjoyed it too. Could we give a round of applause to, to Florian, please? Yeah.